these lists supplied by the Nazis, police chiefs started to rid the police force of so-called undesirables. Officer Bjornsson, political affiliation, social democrat. Dismissed. Officer Hausenfort, political affiliation, liberal. Dismissed. Officer Hanslein, political affiliation, progressive. Dismissed. Officer Hammerfest, political affiliation, whistling. Whistling. Promote him to such. Officer Scheinrock, political affiliation, liberal. Dismissed. Officer Lundstrom, political affiliation. Thus, the Nazis have set up a puppet government. All government officials are quizzling. All police officers are quizzling. A special battalion of quizzling soldiers called the Regiment Nordland has been organized and put under the command of German officers. Now, the Nazis dominate Norway with little effort because of Norwegian safety. Most of the German soldiers have been withdrawn and sent to fronts in Russia or Africa. Proof? Here it is. If you want to see these facts in cold print, read Thomas Reveille's book, The Spoils of Europe. Turn to page 73. But Norway is not the only place where the Nazis have created puppet governments. There are traitors at the head of all subjugated countries. In Czechoslovakia... The National Union Party will cooperate fully with the Nazis. In Belgium... The Rexist Party believes in collaboration with a greater right. In Holland... National Socialist Bewegung shall help Holland take its place in the new order. Heil Hitler. In occupied France. Germany recognizes the most be more national popular as the only party. In unoccupied France. The Vichy regime recognizes the existence of the new order. In Romania. Iron Guard is ready to stand by and free the fight. This puppet government technique is not the only one the Nazis use to keep down the cost. Another and very simple technique is that of starvation. This technique has been frequently used in Poland. In the fall of 1941, at the Warsaw headquarters of Hans Frank, Nazi governor of Poland, an emergency call came through. Headquarters? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Colonel Millibeck? Yeah. Yeah, Colonel. One moment, please, Colonel. Yeah, Governor. What is it? Colonel Millibeck, they're calling for military on 7. He says the building of the new road has been delayed because of a strike of Polish laborers. A strike? Incredible. No resistance, sir. They merely refuse to work. Give me the boat. Colonel. Governor Five. What? Nine. Of course you can't put them all in prison. That is a military road and it must be completed. Nearly cut off their food supply. Succeed. Certainly it will succeed. It always does. I'll hit them. Quite simple, isn't it? You see, the Nazis control not only the source of food, but all transportation facilities as well. By this method, they could, if they so desired, keep certain countries in subjugation forever without sending in one regiment of German soldiers. Proof? Read Lewis L. Lawwin's book, The Economic Consequences of the Second World War. See chapters 7 and 8. But now let us consider a third Nazi technique of domination, control of the weapons of warfare. The Nazis today are moving munitions factories from the occupied countries into Germany proper. Munition factories still located in the conquered territories are under Nazi control. No matter how energetically the oppressed people plot to overthrow the conquerors, the problem of securing weapons is a hopeless obstruction. Take France at this moment. For example, in one Frank city. Who is on the lookout here? Yeah. yeah. Good, good. We can begin now. Jan Zarot. Jan, you will give the report concerning the warehouse ring. Most of what has occurred you know already. Both of us broke into the warehouse at the Rue Chapon. Guns and ammunition were taken. The Nazis discovered us leaving the warehouse. Only eight of us escaped. Of the of the four missing, three were killed. Paul Fobian was wounded. He he died this morning. As to the result of the raid, we secured 53 rifles, six revolvers, eight boxes of cartridges for the rifles, no cartridges at all for the revolvers. That's the report. 63 rifles, that's something at least. Yes, yes, but there must be another raid soon, perhaps Sunday night. It will be as planned before. Now, P.S. Madam Dibble. Thanks. 
There must be no more of such race. Madame DeVoe, we must have arms. The price is too high. For I did in four days. What have we gained? Sixty-three rifles. Why, there are 5,000 police in this city, and each is armed with a submachine gun. And not quite ten miles away are two regiments of Nazi soldiers. They have tanks. Not rifles. Tanks. But there are underground groups all over France. Are all of these quits? No, no, not quits. But wait. Wait until the soldiers are forced to withdraw to fight the Russians and the English and Americans. As if that never happened. Oh, then we're lost. To try to fight without equal weapons is suicide. We grow weaker, not stronger. But the day must come when the Germans are pushed on all fronts. Then it's the odds. Then we'll fight and hasten the end. That's all I have to say. You have heard, Madame Devoe. Does anyone disagree? Very well. This, then, is our last meeting. If you want to fully understand how completely the Nazis have disarmed the conquered countries, read Thomas Turnin's France on Berlin Times. See page 58. But the Nazis have one final technique of domination, perhaps the most effective of all. A conquered people will not be permitted to acquire any technical skills or specialized training. They will be permitted to perform only heavy manual labor or routine jobs in mass production industry. In another generation, knowledge will be the exclusive monopoly of Germany. The Nazis have already put this policy into effect. If the labor gang sent to Germany are men of all nationalities, among them skilled workers and professional men permitted now to do only manual labor. Six years studying medicine at the University of Paris. Look at me now, a ditch digger. Digging in the dirt. What work? It's hard. Hard? Who cares? I was an automobile mechanic in Oslo. Six months more of this, and I'll be fit for nothing else. Don't the Nazis need mechanics? Not Norwegian mechanics. Mechanical knowledge is dangerous. The Nazis make a monopoly of it. They make a monopoly of education, too. Well, what are you? Czech. Taught history in Prague. Now the Nazis write their own histories, and I dig ditches. You are a Hollander. Yes, and a bookkeeper. And a good bookkeeper. These days, all books are in red ink. And bookkeepers dig ditches. All of us dig ditches. How democratic are the Nazis? Yes, quite. You French fought for democracy and law. We Czechs fought. Our Hollander here and our Norwegian, they fought. All of us fought for democracy. All of us lost. But the Nazis give it to us. They make us all equal. Equal? Yes. Equal. All ditch diggers. In another generation, all knowledge will die out among the conquered peoples, and then, unfortunately, they will be perfectly suited to play the role the Nazis have selected for them. That of slaves. How can slaves revolt? What chance have the occupied countries against their puppet government? What chance without arms? What chance when their food supply may be cut off any time the Nazis will it? Don't elude yourself. No one else is going to win this war for you. You must win it yourself. I've been listening to episode 8 series entitled, You Can't Do Business with Hitler. This series is based upon the experiences and observations of Douglas Miller, who was for 15 years commercial attaché to the American Embassy in Berlin. Listen for the ninth program in this series, which is entitled, The Antichrist. This transcribed program, written and directed by Frank Telford, was brought to you by the radio section of the Office for Emergency Management in Washington. Mm-hmm.